This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Hello and welcome back. Uh, my name is Mark Scott. I'm Politico's chief tech correspondent. And before we get into the intricacies of AI diplomacy, we have some opening remarks from our presenting partner, IBM. I'm going to hand over to them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Hi, everybody. Really great to be here uh, in person and really happy that IBM could uh, support the event uh, this year. I'm Jean-Marc Leclerc, Head of EU Affairs for IBM here in Brussels. And I'm also a co-director of our policy lab, which you may have, have heard of. It's our global platform uh, to discuss the most pressing tech policy issues uh, of our time. And you can find out more about what we do, uh, receive our newsletters and our papers on ibm.com slash policy. Now, many of us are gathered here and online because we, well, government, industry, citizens, academics, will play a role in, in, in shaping uh, new regulatory frameworks for AI uh, that support the development of AI and uh, use of trustworthy uh, AI. Now, there are various initiatives, uh, sometimes different in initiatives here in Europe, of course, in the US, in Japan, in Taiwan, in China, in Brazil, to name a, a few. But at IBM, we really strongly believe um, that global convergence should bring these efforts together, at least on a key general principles. One we firmly believe in is that AI policies should promote human-centered objectives. It's short transparency and explainability, uh, as well as limiting uh, bias, but also support innovation through risk-based approaches uh, and an optimistic approach focusing on the benefits of AI, not just the risks. So the next panel will focus on AI diplomacy. Uh, I strongly believe that AI diplomacy is not a nice to have, it's a must have. There are all kinds of government uh, approaches uh, at, the, at the moment through bilateral uh, engagements and through organizations like the OECD, uh, the G7, the G20, the Council of Europe, uh, the Global Partnership on AI, to name a few. And these are essential. But equally essential uh, are the international technical fora where industry can also provide uh, input and support the development of uh, standardization uh, for, for AI. It's really crucial that we have a common un understanding, common principles, a common terminology um, to then allow us to create those methods, those practices, to make sure that all the principles that I've mentioned are turned into uh, practices. One forum we're particularly supportive of at, at IBM is the EU-US Trade and Transatlantic um, Council, the TTC launched last year. It, it's really a key component of this international alignment. So, of course, we definitely support the principles that are uh, on AI uh, in, the, in the TTC on transparency, robustness, accountability, and non-discrimination. But we really hope maybe at the next meeting of the TTC in May uh, in France uh, that the, the two parties will take things a bit further uh, and, and seize the opportunity uh, to, to strengthen the collaboration and focus on, on AI standards in, in particular. Now, I, I'm concluding this, this introduction by highlighting what I think should be our common international objective, which is to build trust. Um, the adoption of the technology is not just based on its efficiency, but also on how much we, we trust it. 
and the knowledge that the awareness that AI is there to serve us and not the other way around. And here, organizations have a big role to play, public and, and, and private. In a recent study uh, from our Institute for Business Value, we talked to around 1,200 executives in, I think, 22 countries around the globe, and 75% of them ranked AI ethics as important. It was less than 50% just four years ago. So there's a big change there in the awareness. So at IBM, we've made trust really the cornerstone uh, of our leadership in, in AI innovation and stand ready to support organizations to develop those trustworthy AI solutions so they're better prepared when regulations like the EU AI Act uh, come uh, into effect. But really on my point on trust is this, it's so important uh, that organizations must not wait for regulations to take effect before uh, they start investing in building trustworthy AI. So with that, I thank you for having me and IBM, and I wish you an excellent panel discussion. Thank you, Mark. Wonderful. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thank you. Um, so ag again, uh, we have a difficult task ahead of us because we are the session before lunch. So uh, I promise I won't keep this uh, too uh, uh, technical, uh, but I also want to say thank you so much to our colleagues from, from Asia who are joining us. I think it's sort of six, seven, maybe eight o'clock with you. So again, maybe it's dinner time uh, for, for you versus lunch for us and our colleague from the US. Uh, hopefully you've had breakfast already. So. Um, uh, it's interesting, the panel, what we have, mostly because it spans the globe, and that's the whole purpose of this discussion, to have talk about AI di diplomacy. Yoshi, maybe can I start from you in, in Japan, mostly because you were involved both in um, 2016 with the G7 work that Japan did, followed by the G20 work, I think, in 2020, that formed the, the basis for the OECD principles in AI. And before, not to give us a history lesson, but could you sort of walk us through the rationale for that and how important that has been in terms of creating some of the underlying principles that we're gonna hopefully unpack in our, on, in our discussion? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you very much uh, for having me today. Uh, as uh, kindly introduced, uh, Japan started, uh, proposed the international discussion in the year of 2016 when we hosted uh, G7 uh, uh, meetings. And uh, uh, in the uh, G7 ICT ministers meeting, we proposed to, to start the international discussion on AI principles. Uh, 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 behind that, uh, we had some discussion already uh, domestically to elaborate uh, the AI uh, principles for uh, research and development. And uh, uh, we also started to believe uh, uh, we need a kind of rule for a future AI society with uh, uh, based on the some democratic values. And uh, the ultimate purpose of the discussion was uh, we wanted to, to to uh, utilize the ben uh, potential of uh, this uh, powerful and emerging technology to the maximum ex extent. And for that purpose, uh, we believe that we need increase and improve the trust uh, by the citizens, users in private sector, also in the government uh, to, to, to raise the trust in this technology. So we proposed the, the discussion and the, the proposal was welcomed by uh, G7 uh, friend countries. And the discussion was made in, in the Italian and the Canadian presidency. And the discussion led to the establishment of global partnership on AI in the year 2022. Also the discussion was uh, 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 succeeded by OECD in the same year of 2016. And uh, this uh, discussion led to the uh, elaboration and the agreement uh, on AI uh, recommendation uh, by OECD ministers uh, in year 2019. And this uh, recommendation was copied to, to a G20 discussion and agreed uh, by all G20 member governments uh, as G20, G20 AI principles. So I believe uh, these are the very uh, fundamental basis for all of us uh, to, to promote uh, a future AI society based on human-centered uh, values. And uh, uh, we are now uh, in the stage 
to think about how we could uh, implement these principles. And we see there are some uh, separate ways now uh, for, for uh, different uh, countries and regions. Uh, for Japan, we are still pursuing a soft law-based approach uh, without introducing binding regulation at this moment, because we believe it is AI is still in the very early stage of the technological development, and it is very difficult to, to, to introduce a, a kind of a precise regulation uh, on risk-based uh, management approach. But uh, we believe uh, there are different ways uh, because different countries have, different regions have different culture background, historical backgrounds, and social, societal or economic uh, uh, conditions. But uh, we hope, even if we have different ways to implement these principles, we need uh, to, uh, to, to maintain the interoperability. Convergence must be a very strong word, but uh, we hope uh, we can see some converged uh, uh, future in, in the AI, global AI society. Thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. That's, that's a really good introduction. Um, I think the word human-centered comes up a lot. and. Ella, maybe I want to switch to you in DC. We're going to get a lot of jet lag in this conversation, I think, uh, just in terms of the importance of having some of that work in place as you move towards sort of implementation, particularly when it comes to standards. How much we have the principles laid out by the OECD based on the G20. How much is that important in terms of, you know, as the West, the US, and others work together on standardizing this, the <laughs> Uh, AI, if you will, how important is it to have those existing baselines in place? Yes, uh, the, good morning or uh, good day to everybody. Thanks for the uh, invitations and uh, happy to be here. Um, the, right, so uh, it's it's certainly really important to have some sort of core building block, some sort of uh, uh, commonality in belief on what trust and trustworthy means. and. Uh, and globally, researchers, developers, consumers, policymakers all have expressed their desire and need to understand uh, the technical and societal risks related to AI technologies. Uh, and, and we heard also that, you know, as we're talking about risk, we should also talk about, you know, it should be a discussion about minimizing risk and maximizing uh, positive. So uh, we shouldn't just talk about harms and risks. In terms of the uh, principles, so, uh, we welcome the global discussions around trustworthy AI. Uh, U.S. is a signatory to OECD AI recommendation, and uh, as, as we all know, there are several national policies, including policy documents in the U.S. And uh, the good thing is that there is all, uh, many of these documents, or maybe all of these documents, are based on uh, protecting democratic values and rights and dignity of citizens, and they all uh, propose a human-centered AI approach. The challenge or gap is that these principles are yet aspirational uh, and value-based. An opportunity for us as a tech community is to translate these aspirational principles into requirements, into attributes that we want to see in the systems, attributes and requirements that are implementable and testable. In other words, we have to unpack the word trust and trustworthy and answer the question, what constitutes trust? And, and that goes across, uh, uh, a, a, we, we heard that, you know, a software approach, and I take it as um, a characteristics and attributes of the technology for, to be trustworthy. And um, that could be uh, technical and socio-technical characteristics. Uh, I'll talk about them a little bit. Uh, 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 but but you can have a technology that's that's built on, you know, is a very trustworthy and by, by design and development is trustworthy. Uh, but we also need to have guard base for responsible use of technology. And then uh, beyond that, we should also spend time, effort, uh, and research on how to build trust and confidence of individuals in the systems that hopefully is built trustworthy and used responsible. And while the policy landscape that governs this area will continue to evolve across borders and discussions happen across uh, all uh, corners of the globe, um, and scientists are working to provide, uh, provide scalable research-based methods to assess risk and advance trustworthy approaches to AI where it can serve all people in responsible, equitable, and beneficial way. So what we had done is that we had launched a consensus-driven, open, transparent, and collaborative process to develop a AI risk management framework. 
Uh, this framework adopts a rights-preserving approach to AI, meaning that protection of individual rights is at forefront of the AI development and use. Uh, this process, as I said, is open uh, for participation for everybody. We have run several workshops and uh, drafts for public comments. Uh, the last one was a draft that we sent out in March for public comments. Uh, what it does, it outlines a process to address the traditional technical measures of accuracy, robustness, and re uh, reliability but also acknowledge the socio-technical characteristics of AI systems. Um, characteristics such as privacy, interpretability or explainability, safety and mitigation of bias, uh, which are inextricably tied to human and social behavior. And these are as um, important- can I, just stop you? Sorry, can I just stop you there? I, I just wanna make sure I get the other two speakers in, so forgive me for, for interrupting. Um, I wanna, be, uh, build on what you both said, because I think it, there is a consensus around human rights based consensus driven approach, multi stakeholder, etc. But Yuchi, you mentioned Japan is taking a soft power approach um, to, to this. Dragos here in Europe, maybe less so. And again, my job as a reporter maybe is to uh, pick out some of the differences, so forgive me, but Dragos, if others are doing a soft, softly approach or even a sectoral approach, uh, and uh, to Alan's point that you know, opening up to, to comment from others, is Europe finding itself a little bit isolated in terms of going hard on regulation early, rather than maybe focusing on the AI principles that outline the OECD and letting the market figure it out for the time being? Well, I would certainly not say that. <laughs> I would actually say that what Europe is trying to do is, is to be a, a trendsetter in a way. Um, and that, if you allow 20 seconds of publicity, speaking of hard law, which is to say that actually today, finally, the draft report, uh, the draft legislative report uh, on which myself and Brando Winifei worked on is going to be available as of this afternoon, one week later, but it's still there. Um, going, back to, going back to hard law versus soft law, um, we've set an ambition here in the EU already two, three years ago, and actually it was an ambition that was building on work that was done in all of these multilateral fora on uh, principles, on ethics, it was based on work that the Commission itself had done through the high-level working group. And there was this ambition of actually coming up with legislation with hard law on actually encapsulating all those values on which we agree upon, and I think that's a fundamental thing to say, but to encapsulate them in actual norms, in actual rules on actually how AI should be developed. And I think that once we've set this ambition, uh, implicitly or expressly, we also have to set an ambition on how we influence global standards. And uh, we're not going to achieve that simply by the beauty of our legislative technique. Uh, the Brussels effect is not going to come automatically. We're going to have to work hard for that. And I think the one thing which was also mentioned by, by the, the other speakers, the one thing is to engage in meaningful diplomacy. And we've done that. And I think we need to continue to do that. We mm -hmm. cannot be complacent and neither can we be arrogant about it. And I think that's a very important thing to say. We have to realize that, again, simply by us coming up first, maybe with hard law, although India, I understand, is also quite advanced as well, and Brazil uh, also. But even if we're going to be the first movers in terms of legislation, again, that in itself will not suffice. Mm. We will have to also, again, engage with like-minded partners, engage in all of these multilateral fora, OECD, UNESCO, G7, G20, to actually make sure that we bring all of those like-minded around uh, the fundamentals of what we're going to have in legislation. And then we're going to have to work together on standards, which is going to be the next layer of complexity, but also equally important and relevant. Can I maybe turn to our colleague from, from, from Taiwan? I mean, Taiwan has had, I believe, the AI strategy in place from 2018 that involved both, both looking at regulation as well as investment. When you see your colleagues from Japan, the US, and, and the European Union talking about the consensus-based approach, soft law versus hard, Taiwan obviously has a thriving local tech sector, or less so maybe in AI, but still quite by burgeoning. How does say, a, a country like Taiwan fit into the discussion that's going on at these global fora in terms of, yes, we have consensus based, but there are differences of opinion in how that should be implemented? Well, okay. <clears throat> uh, I heard uh, uh, many keywords, many important keywords, like uh, 
democracy value, like the human century, like the uh, trust wars, AI. And actually, at in 2018, we just encourage uh, people doing AI research, develop the AI application and innovation. But after one or two years, we aware that we need to let people know some AI principle and general guideline to protect uh, people uh, not uh, hurt by AI application. And we all know that data is the new oil and AI is the organism machine. The behavior of this uh, machine were determined by the data you feed in this machine. So we have to aware of AI bias. I mean, when we apply the AI technology, we have to let people aware of the risk behind these new technologies. So we try to convince people, try to make this as a part of our education. Uh, when you apply the AI, you need to aware of uh, this AI bias. Let me give you an example. If you do the Google photo search for nurse keyword, you will find all a female nurse. And it's very difficult to find the, the male nurse. I believe that uh, a kind of uh, AI bias, or you can say the data bias. So um, that's quite important to let people know that. And I think uh, recently, many people work on the federated learning. That should be a good idea to mitigate the AI bias. And we also encourage uh, different um, unit to cooperate when they develop the, the AI application and use the federated learning can protect the data and also can have, can avoid the AI bias. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to say, probably we need uh, some different benchmark validation data set for different uh, application. So when the AI product, AI solution go to the market, we need some test. It can be done, uh, follow the international standard. So I would like to say, we probably develop the AI locally, but we have to, uh, we need have some uh, international standard. When we uh, adopt the AI to the local market, different local market, we still need to do the adaptation for uh, local regulations. So we try to put this kind of principle uh, to all the people using AI in Taiwan. And I believe that uh, Taiwan is very happy to follow or to participate the international organization and follow the international regulations. Mm. Th thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, um, as, a, as a scientist yourself and someone who or you or your colleagues would have to implement whatever <laughs> rules or principles are in place, can you walk me through some of the practicalities? How do we move from maybe principles and standards to actual something that is, is workable for the people and practitioners uh, who, who actually have to live by whatever standards come through, either through the, you know, the global partnership of AI or domestic rules, depending where they are. I mean, it, it feels to me we're at an inflection point where we have these global or Western-based standards, but there's a question mark over how that then gets turned into practice. And just what, what do you, I mean, you must be thinking about this. How, how do you approach that sort of practical nature of this problem? Uh, right, and, and that's, that's, that's really important. And uh, I, I, in answering that, I, I probably summarized everything that we heard. Uh, so uh, the first thing is agreeing on a set of uh, principles, common values, what we expect from the AI systems. And there's a lot of good discussions about that. Then we have to get them into the requirements and come up with a, I think the word terminology and vocabulary has been used to make sure that we know what we're talking about. I think we all agree that we want the system to be uh, 
uh, non-bias or bias be uh, mitigated. Uh, we want the system to be interpretable and ex explainable, but uh, each of us may have different understanding of those. So uh, bringing uh, the core community on a shared understanding of what we mean by those things, this allows us to understand what it is that needs to be measured and write standards about what, what, what each of those things mean uh, to give that uh, common ground and then get into um, uh, uh, how to measure for this. And I think the uh, validation, verification, test and evaluations, benchmarks all was mentioned. Um, so what are the metrics, methodologies, uh, uh, frameworks for uh, testing the systems for the um, characteristics of the trustworthiness that has been, that has been mentioned. Uh, so these all gives us the right uh, guardrails, the right guidelines on how to you know what, what trust and trustworthy means, how to test for them. But, um, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the important questions of how to get them into the practice and how to do this, it's, it's really a culture, a culture change and a culture of understanding, communicating, and uh, wanting to uh, manage risk. And that's a really important thing to do. We want to avoid these discussions to become a checklist, but, but a, a, uh, a, a continuous uh, uh, a continuous loop of uh, identifying, mapping, measuring, and managing risk uh, during the whole life cycle of the AI. Uh, so, uh, and, and make risk management and understanding all of this, uh, not an afterthought, but something that's from the get-go is part of the design of the systems and part of the uh, uh, start of the system. So in, in the uh, risk management framework, a good portion of that is spent on the governance. Uh, uh, policy procedures, rules and responsibilities uh, of everybody across an organization uh, for uh, uh, development use and uh, test of uh, trustworthy AI. But thank you. Uh, Yochi, ahead of the, um, I believe there's a meeting at the Global Partnership for AI in Japan by the end of the year. How much, it, I think there's 25 countries, Western countries signed up, I believe, for, for the partnership. How important is that? to what Alan just said in terms of trying to create some of these uh, sort of standards, but also the, the interoperability question that you mentioned before in terms of making sure that what say happens in Japan is, can at least interconnect in some way with what's going on here in Europe and, and the US, et cetera. How, how, how much is GPI gonna play a role in that, do you think? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, we have, uh, uh, actually, we had a, a kind of inter internal uh, discussion on uh, uh, JPI Summit uh, uh, inside the government uh, today. And uh, we are very much looking forward to hosting the, the event and also the hosting the uh, presidency of the group. Uh, the uh, JPI is an uh, uh, initiative to promote uh, 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 project-based uh, efforts uh, um, uh, in a multi-stakeholder approach. So that means, uh, you know, the uh, experts from different communities are participating to exchange the knowledge or uh, expertise, and uh, uh, we will uh, uh, deliver uh, uh, bottom-up uh, activities and uh, 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 some uh, practical uh, uh, achievements. So uh, I think uh, there should be a kind of uh, uh, collaborative and uh, a kind of uh, interactive uh, 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 discussions uh, between different stakeholders and the GPI uh, uh, can contribute uh, through multi-stakeholder discussion to not only to the policy discussion on regulation or poli uh, other policy frameworks, but also to the uh, efforts uh, by the private sectors, uh, by uh, businesses or civil societies. And uh, uh, that, that would be a very great opportunity to, uh, for, for everybody to join together and discuss uh, AI uh, challenges and opportunities and uh, deliver uh, and uh, uh, transmit uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, recommendations or advices or messages to the rest of the world. So uh, I would recommend, uh, encourage all of you to join us and uh, work together toward a trustworthy uh, human-centric AI in the future. Great. Well, you heard it first, it's a free trip to Japan for anyone who wants to go, so. <laughs> um, in the opening remarks from our uh, partner at IBM, Jean-Marc mentioned the Trade and Tech Council. 
uh, and we're now 20 minutes into this conversation. We haven't really mentioned China or any Western alliance against or um, promotion of Western values versus a, maybe a more authoritarian view. Dragos, you, you, I think you were in Washington last year to talk to uh, people on the Hill. Um, the Trade and Tech Council was meeting in a couple of weeks. Although I think AI is going to be played down a little bit, it's still there. How much do you think that creation of a sort of coalition of the willing in terms of Western democratic principles is, is fundamental? Uh, you know, if we are looking at China, uh, even Russia, and how others may be using AI in other form, in, in, in ways that maybe we in the West aren't that fond of. I think it's key because of how important AI is. And I think that's the one important thing we all need to understand uh, because of its profound effects on everything, uh, economy, society, politics, democracy. Uh, it is just not um, unimportant or irrelevant uh, how you actually set up these rules. Mm. Um, and everyone spoke of values. Uh, and it's again, not by coincidence that we all speak of values and that we want to follow a value-based approach when we either write principles, soft law, or whether when we write hard law. And evidently this is going to put us on, and it is putting us on a collision path uh, with China, simply because we work with different values. China understands human rights differently than we do. China understands the right to privacy differently than we do. And China understands democracy certainly differently than we do. Which means that uh, clearly we will have to see uh, in our work to set that the rules I was mentioning earlier, we also have to be wary of how we write the standards. We've kind of recently historically been sleepwalking into irrelevance when it comes to the uh, international standard uh, setting bodies. And I think we need to wake up to the reality that this is where important work is going to be done. Once we write the principles, once we write the rules, even once we here in Europe are going to write our legislation, it's still going to be very important how the actual technical standards are going to be produced. That's why also the work that is being done now under the TTC framework on actual standards, on figuring out together with our transatlantic partners, how do you actually measure a bias, for example. So very concrete focus on how we are going to produce these standards and then strategically, how we're going to impose these standards on a global stage alongside our like-minded partners like Japan, like Australia, like South Korea, like all those that actually understand values, going back to values yep. in the same way. Yep. And uh, with the time we have left, um, to our colleague in, in Taiwan, you mentioned the bias, and I think it's interesting. Again, I'm by no means an uh, expert in sort of Asian uh, or sort of Taiwanese or Japanese AI policy, but I do, f it's interesting that some of the biases that we get sort of uh, in Europe uh, for the v complexities, uh, in, I'm compounded that by, you look at so, sort of what goes on uh, in other parts of the world. I, I mean, values is one thing, biases is another. You mentioned the importance of mitigating some of these biases. Are you confident that's going to happen in terms of, you know, creating these values, but also making sure that whatever happens locally isn't getting biased in any way? Oh, okay. I, I would like to say bias sometimes happen when you did not aware of your data, actually select from different area. For example, if you, you try to train your AI machines, AI algorithm, you only use the CT's data, then you probably will not learn the behavior of people live in small town. That's the so-called bias. But somehow there are some malicious uh, intention to apply AI. That's, I would not call that bias. That's just uh, invalid the, the human values. And, you know, right now we talk about the privacy. And we, for example, we should uh, restrict the facial, uh, face recognition technology applications. So in some area, we shouldn't use the, the uh, face recognition technologies. So that's, that's I call the bias. But I really think we probably, uh, when we try to sell AI service or AI application, maybe uh, we should put some, uh, warning statement let people know that they have the potential risk in these applications wonderful 
Yeah. I think we're, we're out of time, so I want to thank our colleagues uh, in, in Asia for, for missing dinner to, to be with us, as well as Elam in, in DC to, uh, for, for being with us this morning. Um, without trying to skip steps, I believe there might be lunch outside. There are also some roundtable discussions, um, one on AI and healthcare with my colleague Peter, uh, and then on AI and cybersecurity with, with my colleague uh, Lawrence. Uh, so, so thank you so much to the speakers, and thank you for joining us.